Um, the original title that was was uh, suggested at the beginning was "Is Stoic Theology Useful: A Devil's Advocacy Argument?" And I thought, well, I don't want to be a devil's advocate, and uh, I think we're going to get a lot of stuff about Stoic theology. So I'm going to shift the topic slightly, given the um, overall theme of, of the conference, uh, which I, I, I really think is, is quite good. There's, you know, this notion that religion or belief in God, something, you know, quite encompassing offers comfort or meaning to people. And, you know, the question is, can, can Stoicism do the same? So I think that's a, a really great question. And it opens up the possibility for, you know, doing some comparison between uh, Stoicism and the things that we typically think of as religion. So I, I decided to shift focus to what we could call analogies, kind of in Seneca's sense, where it's not exactly like a ratio or something like that, but we get a, a grasp on something by seeing uh, matters, you could say, in their native habitat. And this, this question about Stoicism and religion, in a very, very broad sense, comes up endlessly in the Facebook groups. If any of you participate in those, you see that stuff coming up a lot. I imagine, I don't uh, actually check out Stoicism Reddit, but it's probably showing up there as well. So I think there's a lot to, to talk about. And I think we're, we're going to hear a lot about that from other people in this. Um, and there's a lot of other related topics connected to this, the compatibility between Stoicism and varieties of religion. So I, I thought we could, you know, begin by thinking about religion itself. And there's a lot of complexity and you could say moving parts and distinctions and interconnections and similarities between what we typically label as religions and what we nowadays also call philosophies of life. Or if you like, you know, Alistair McIntyre's term, tradition constituted rationalities, there's a lot of ways of talking about this. And Stoicism fits in there quite well. There are some, you know, identifiable philosophies of life that people see as coming out of religious traditions. Um, you know, you could think about uh, Confucianism or Buddhism, uh, but there are, you know, very secular versions of these as well. And, you know, if we think about historically the use of Epictetus by the monks in the monasteries who took the Enchiridion and very, you know, I think we all know this story, changed Socrates to Christ and the philosopher to the monk. There's an adaptability there. And they were also reading, you know, uh, Seneca quite a lot. Um, they were getting a lot from Cicero, from the Neoplatonists. And so there's this, this very rich kind of soup historically that we can talk about that has a lot of ingredients to it. And I think one of the things that could be very helpful is in thinking less about trying to define things very carefully, because um, as we're going to see, there is no consensus definition of, of religion. Um, and thinking in terms of a Greek term that we're all familiar with in its English version, heresy, which comes from hieresis, which originally means a choice. And a choice of what? A choice of your philosophical or religious or whatever other kind of commitments. And so it was, it was quite common to talk about you know, Stoicism as being a heresis, just like Epicureanism was or Neoplatonism was. And you could also uh, think about you know, religious practices that way as well. And I think there's so when we think about it that way, there's a lot of overlap. And we can talk about the meaningfulness for people who are practicing it as something that draws them in. Now, as I mentioned, there is no consensus definition of religion. Anybody who like tries to quote a dictionary definition uh, is, you know, they're, they're overlooking the fact that within uh, religious studies, um, just like in philosophy as well, in philosophy of religion, there is a whole variety of definitions. We almost have too many of them, and nobody is entirely on board with, with these. Um, and the same thing goes for philosophy, by the way. It's kind of an embarrassment that philosophy, there's too many definitions of it, and the philosophers themselves don't agree on it. Um, you could say the same thing for uh, psychology for emotion, for all these important terms. So maybe we get away from worrying over too much about definitions. And we think instead about, well, you know, what are the 
what are the things that we typically associate with religion? There's a number of different scholars that we could turn to. Ninian Smart is sort of a commonplace with his seven uh, dimensions of religion, doctrinal, mythological, ethical, ritual, experimental, institutional, and material. And if we look at how Stoicism is practiced, or we look at its, its uh, you know, development over time, I think you can you can see some of these figuring in there. The ethical is, of course, very important. You can ask if there's a doctrinal content. I think that's quite clear that there is as well, although not everybody agrees on precisely what it is. Um, you know, you can talk about a ritual uh, a dimension to it, definitely experiential, particularly when we're getting together in groups. Um, there might be an institutional aspect to it. I mean, there are groups out there and, and uh, uh, important, uh, we could call them institutions within largely the, the internet sphere. Um, you know, so that there's, there's room for looking at connections or similarities between Stoicism and religion. Um, and Smart is just one of many people we could bring up. You know, if, if we had much longer time, we could talk about William James and the varieties of religious experience and whether we could talk about varieties of uh, Stoic practice and groups and, you know, th things along, uh, along those lines. Um, when it comes to Stoicism, we're probably better off. We don't have a definition of it. I mean, there are people out there who are like, give, a, give an elevator pitch for Stoicism. And those are nice, <laughs> as elevator pitches. But, you know, like Seneca points out to us, Stoicism is a complex set of uh, self-reinforcing and uh, referring ideas. And, you know, you're not, you know, if you try to encapsulate it in a single formula, you're not, you're not getting that much. But we can certainly say there are some things that are stoic and some things that are not stoic, right? If you say, for example, pleasure is the only good. Okay, not stoic. Epicurean or otherwise hedonist, but clearly not Stoic. If you say something like virtue is the only good, well, you know, that's definitely there as important. It's not the totality of Stoicism, but it's, it's a good start. And, um, you know, when we think about Stoicism and its emergence within the Mediterranean and, and, and Near East world in antiquity, and then its encounter with all sorts of other let's call them ways of life or ways of thinking, you could, you know, you can say that Stoicism was viewed as a rival, not just by other philosophies, but also by uh, religious people and their communities and their, their traditions. You know, uh, we can definitely see this in Christianity where the early church fathers constantly talking about the Stoics. Uh, you know, think about Lactantius and his uh, treatise on divine anger where the Stoics and the Epicureans are his main uh, opponents and interlocutors, um, Jewish authors, um, even, you know, pagan authors of a certain sort. You could think of like, you know, the, the pagan Neoplatonist tradition, which draws heavily on Stoicism and, and Aristotelianism, you know, Simplicius's commentary on Epictetus's um, and Caridian, a lot of talk about God in that, right? So, you know, the, the Stoics were, were viewed as being... Were they religious? Uh, yes and no. I mean, there's providence, as we're going to hear about uh, shortly, uh, but there's not an awful lot of personal interaction. It's not a way of life in which prayer plays a fundamental role. I mean, Epictetus talks about God as caring about particulars, but he might be an outlier when it comes to that. Um, there is this beautiful idea that you see in Epictetus and in Seneca uh, of a commonwealth or a political community, which is the world of human beings and gods. So we are connected with the divine in some way in, in classical Stoicism. It's not like the gods show up as in Greek fables in disguise and hang out with us or anything like that. But um, there is this sense of, of community that matters. Um, there's also this sense of there being a bit of God within all of us. I mean, Epictetus is super clear about that. That's why you shouldn't treat people badly. Uh, not just you're screwing your, your own little bit of God up, say, when you go to the uh, uh, house of prostitution or do other bad things. But, you know, when you, when you mistreat your neighbor, you're 
messing around with uh, this this bit of God. And, you know, is that the same thing as the, you know, icon uh, Theu or the, you know, Imago Dei? Not exactly, but it's, it's pretty close, you know, and there are some similar ramifications. Obviously, there's a huge overlap in terms of ethics, the four cardinal virtues, which get some really great discussion in Stoic texts, are definitely not unique to the Stoics, the Platonists, even the Epicureans, you know, recognize those, and that's taken up by Jewish and Christian authors as well. Um, you know, the focus on the will and what's up to us, um, we're going to see that as, as, as central in many different traditions. Moral development is, is very important. Um, you know, and we can also talk about what is what is the end, what is the the goal. You know, if it's something like tranquility or um, getting along with people or having a meaningful life or something like that. I think there's a lot of overlap, even in ancient Stoicism, with with uh, all the other things that are going on, the other hieraces, as we were calling it earlier. And if we think about um, you know our contemporary concerns. The, you know, there, people talk about modernity as being a time not just of secularism, which doesn't actually seem to be, uh, uh, you know, quite so easy to take for granted these days, at least here in, in the United States, um, but also being a, a time in which we have this meaning crisis, right? People are having less meaningful lives, and I think a lot of people are thinking that Stoicism could could help out with that, and probably, probably rightly so. Um, I think, you know, Here's where we can ask, well, what do people take religion to mean? And then we can say, okay, what, what things are Stoicism doing or providing or offering that would fit into that? And, um, you know, it, it's clear that not only is there no consensus about r what religion is among the you know, scholars in religious studies or philosophers of religion or sociologists of religion, it's very clear that people um, all over the place have a whole bunch of different ideas about what religion means, not just in general, but for them. What does it mean to be committed to a religious life? And so I, I put together a kind of typology that might provoke some interesting discussion of ways in which people live out, or at least think they're living out, their religious commitments. And I think we can see some of the similar things in, in Stoicism, uh, at least you know, within the vast Stoic community. So there are some people who are very pragmatic you know, and experiential, and they're like, I just want to try this thing out. I'm not going to commit in any major way until I see some fruits. And you know, people do this in, in churches and, you know, uh, synagogues and pick whatever else you want. And I think there's a lot of people doing that with, with Stoicism. Uh, it's sort of like an, they look for the entry points, what we often call the gateway drugs, right? <laughs> as, as we're introducing people to it. And then at the other extreme, there's what I call the immediate convert, the person who runs into something and they're like, holy crap, this is amazing. I can't get enough of this, right? And they jump into it uh, wholeheartedly and very often with you, know, you could say blinders on or the proverbial uh, rose-colored glasses. Sometimes that manages to sustain them for a while. Sometimes they, uh, they get burnt out on it. And I think we see people doing this with, with Stoicism as well. Um, closely related to this would be the people who basically treat religion as if it is you know, their community is their in-group and everybody else is in the out-group and religion becomes, you know, just another set of group dynamics. And I think there's people like that with Stoicism. They're on Team Stoic and um, sometimes they actually misrepresent what Stoicism is because they haven't studied it enough. But they, you know, they want, uh, they want a very strong division between the Stoics and then like, you know, say those dirty Epicureans or whoever else, right? Um, we also have people who you could call, in, in religion, we call these church hoppers, right? Uh, or church shoppers, right? And I think people do this with, with philosophies of life as well. They try one out and they're like, yeah, not for me, go to another one. And they just keep moving from uh, place to place, so to speak, and uh, commitments. Um, and then, you know, all of these are not bad, I would say. One that is, you know, I, I guess we could call it bad. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it up to you to think about this. 
people who are in the group, sometimes they like to police everybody else, you know? And these are the people who are chiming in constantly and saying, that's not stoic of you, you know? And you're like, well, who the hell made you the, the uh, king of, of the stoics, as Seneca might say, right? Um, and, you know, is this like what happens in religious organizations or political organizations or any other? Yes, of course. So, so there's certain types. Um, we have evangelists, people who are, um, you know, turning now to groups outside or individuals outside. They've got this great, you know, thing that they want to share with everybody and they're constantly doing that. I think we can say there are stoic evangelists of, of that sort. Um, there are the insiders or institutionally associated people, the ones who keep everything going, the ones who see the, how the proverbial sausage is being made. And uh, it takes a certain kind of stomach to do that because um, just as with any other organization, people are not always living up to the ideals that they profess. But we, we you know, to put on a conference like this, it's work, right? So we have to do that. Um, and then, uh, you know, before we go into too many others, because I could go on and on about this. There's one other group that I, I think is, is worth bringing up where there's kind of an interesting analogy. And I hesitate to call them stoic um, monks and nuns or ascetics, but I think there is something kind of like that, a recognition. If you think about what, what did the original um, ascetics want to do? They withdrew from society, not because they're like, well, society sucks, screw it all. They're like, I, you know, I need some peace and quiet and some being able to concentrate on what I'm trying to do with my life. You know, with the monks, it's an orientation to, to God so they can pray better and maybe make themselves um, less miserable bastards that they come in. As Stoics, uh, maybe there's less prayer, but there is also an emphasis on the damaged beings that we are and trying to slowly improve this and maybe you know evangelization would be a distraction or policing others would be a distraction and I think that um, this is a very important part of uh, stoic life for for many people I mean I could say I know people who who behave like that they're they're not usually the ones doing a lot of organization right they're they're uh, trying to withdraw and just practice this stuff now can we, can we draw analogies to different ways in which people um, live out their, their religious lives and say that you know, these are possibilities for Stoicism as a philosophy of life? I would say definitely. Um, they're not exactly the same. There are some vital differences, which we, we certainly can't explore. But I think it's worth thinking about all of these different um, types that we we encounter, right? And figuring out where we fit into these as well. I would say I'm probably, when it comes down to it, because of my involvements over the last years, I've been one of the sort of institutionally oriented people. And that's actually taken time away from practice and study, you know, uh, that I'm kind of looking forward to uh, getting back to as I pair back on, on some of those commitments. So, so does anybody have any uh, questions about this um, kind of disorganized proposal? Yeah, I think that loosening boundaries is, is a good way to talk about it. I, I will throw in one other thing that I, I didn't quite say. I mean, I don't think that stoicism needs to be made into a like rival religion. I think there's enough space that, um, it, you know, being a philosophy of life is already enough, right? It, it certainly has some, in its classical form, it certainly has some what we would typically call religious commitments, meaning about beliefs and, you know, a providential ordering of the universe or things like that. But, um, you know, how did you put it? Uh, we, we don't have to have, like, barriers or we don't have to... Maybe another way of thinking is we don't have to have like identification, you know, so stoicism doesn't need to like shift over into this thing that we, we call religion uh, in order for it to be very, very helpful and useful and, and, and to provide meaning for people's life. I mean, I don't think you necessarily need to be a religious believer and committed and, you know, practicing all the time in order to have a, a very meaningful life. And I, I would suspect that for a lot of people, it actually does get in the way, you know, depending on how, how it's being played out. So, yeah, that, that um, I mean, that might be a perennial temptation for some character types, right, to, to get um, 
get into everybody else's business because it takes away focus from your own, right? The more time that you're like telling other people, oh, that's not stoic of you or you've got things wrong or something like that, the, the less time you have for like looking at how screwed up you are and how to unscrew yourself up using stoic philosophy. And I will admit that I myself have uh, succumbed to that temptation from time to time.